Good morning, it is Sunday, February 28th, 2021, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin this morning giving a little introduction to this. It is my belief that when we get saved, when we come to understand the gospel of salvation and to believe it in our hearts, to trust Jesus Christ, recognizing because of our sinfulness, we have this need for redemption. And it is only through faith in Jesus Christ is the only means by whereby we can be delivered from our condemnation. But when we do trust Christ and him alone, where there is now therefore no condemnation for us. And I believe very strongly in the sovereignty of God in all things. And when we put our faith in Christ, God takes us out of Adam and puts us into Christ redemptively. But today, as members of the church, the body of Christ, he also places every believer today into the body of Christ, sovereignly, wherever he chooses to place that believer. And he has ordained good works for every member of the body of Christ, that we should walk in them. And so it is my position, it wasn't always my faith, but I've come to this place to realize now that from the moment I was saved, God's purpose for my life was ordained from that point on, and my heart's desire should be to fulfill that purpose as a believer in Jesus Christ. But I confess that in myself, I, I have no concept or I have some opinion what tomorrow is going to be like, but I have no real knowledge of what tomorrow is going to be. I have no real knowledge of what's going to happen in the next 10 seconds. But we plan accordingly, but I believe that God is the only one that truly knows the specifics of each of our lives and our future. And that's why I've come to a place in my faith that my only desire in my spiritual walk is to be faithful to God's purpose for my life. And I can't perform that in myself so I must completely trust in him and in the indwelling Holy Spirit's power to perform that purpose in my life and I believe that's true for everybody and uh, I've been burdened and I haven't started yet but I want to do a study to show that as far as God is concerned when you put your faith in Christ, as far as this world's concerned, you die. Now we still live in this physical body, in this material world, and we still have to, many of us, or some of us, or, but we still have to breathe oxygen, we, some of us have to go to work, some of us we have to provide for our loved ones, and we have a purpose in this world. But as far as God is concerned in our life in this world, he's not really that concerned about that. He's more concerned about our spiritual walk with him. And I believe, like in Romans chapter 5, where it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we, and I mess this up, in whom, but it says, in, in whom we have trusted or something, into this grace in which we stand. 
And so with this pandemic, a term has been thrown around a lot now, talking about in the bubble. And I think that means, as far as a pandemic is concerned, that you're in a bubble of people that you have been involved with daily, like your family. And so that bubble allows you in that environment, supposedly, to uh, live without a mask and to live without social distancing. I just heard the other day some guy said, I guess they think now that elevation has something to do with the spread of the virus. He went on to say, because in a restaurant, you can sit at the table with other people around you and the waitress coming back and forth. And as long as you're sitting, you're okay. But as soon as you stand up, put that mask on. <laughs> so they've determined it might have something to do with elevation. <laughs> well, we live in a valley. <laughs> I mean, life, life in this world, if you get too hung up on this world, you're missing the whole life that we have in Christ. And so, <clears throat> I believe our salvation was by the power of divine intervention. Our spiritual life is also maintained and controlled by the indwelling Spirit of God. And we are, the passage we're going to read is going to talk about that. So let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. If you have last week's passage, that was in Corinthians, where it was talking about the, the preaching of the cross is foolishness and the wisdom of the world is foolishness and all of those things. But here in Romans 8, beginning with verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And that's the point I just talked to, was the fact that when we got saved, from that point on, it is God's desire that our minds are set in accordance with the Spirit. And so verse 6, the mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Now again, this is again part of the overall teaching for me that points out that sinful, the sinful mind is what the only thing that unsaved people have. They don't have the Spirit of God. They have a spirit. But that spirit is separated from God at this point when you're unsaved. And so it, all that person has is the sinful mind or the fleshly mind. And it says that it does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. And so it is my opinion that it's only by the grace of God that we are saved through faith alone. And so in verse 8, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. And now here comes a part that I've struggled with for a long time. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And so that makes it really plain to me that it's saying that if you are saved, you have the Spirit of God living in you, and it is controlling your life. That's one of the things that people that struggle with the sovereignty of God have a difficult time comprehending. If God is sovereign and if he's in complete control of everything, how come all these horrific things happen? I mean, that's one of the things that natural man can't resolve. They say, I can't believe in a God that says he loves me 
and yet this happens to me. And that's one of the big resistances to the sovereignty of God in all things. So I've come to believe, and, and I'd be happy to discuss this with anybody, but God being sovereign is in complete control of everything. But he doesn't micromanage it. He has given the human race freedom of volition, which means we can choose anything we want to choose. And the natural man will not choose the things of God. And so by God's grace and through the convincing work of the Spirit of God, we have come to understand and be convinced by the Spirit that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And when we believe that, when it's, we believe it's true, we're saved. And to me, that's how simple it is. And that's all by God's grace. My only activity in my salvation was to believe the truth. And it was all by the power of God. And so if that spirit lives in us today, it too is sovereign in our lives. It is controlling our lives. But it allows us freedom of volition. We can choose whatever we want. The Apostle Paul says, all things are legal for me. But I will not be brought under the control of any of them. And he repeats it, maybe in the other order, but he again says, all things are legal for me. But I will not, uh, all things are not expedient for me, he said. And so we have freedom of choice as a believer in Jesus Christ. And there are times in our lives where the Spirit of God, I can't think of my word, but there are times when the Spirit of God takes control of our life specifically and directs us, gives us insight into truth, gives us thoughts, all of those things. I've, I've experienced times in my life, and I assume you have too, where almost as clearly as if somebody was standing right in front of your face, you're hearing something in your mind. And I've come to realize once in a while that's the Spirit of God telling me, don't do that, Mark. You don't have to do that. And I've shared this with a lot of you, but a lot of you have never heard this story. But I was in the teacher's lounge one day, and there were several men and women in the lounge having a discussion about a boy and a girl that uh, were, had a few problems. And uh, I knew something about that situation that nobody else in the room knew. And th I believe this is how the flesh works. It didn't take the devil to get me to want to say what I wanted to say. It was just my pride. And I knew that nobody else knows this. And when I say it, they're all just going to laugh. It's going to be just an uproar of laughter. And just as clearly as if somebody was talking to me, and this happened in an instant. But Mark, you don't have to say anything. Yeah, but I want to. It's going to be so great. You don't have to say anything. I want them. And so I said it. And instead of this uproar of laughter, it was total silence. And the next thing that was said, and that came from a Christian. Now the Spirit of God gave me that freedom. He gave me that choice. And I chose to serve the flesh. I chose to serve my own exaltation or my own thinking that it'll make me, they'll all feel good about me. And I've come to realize that that's all about the flesh. Whenever we're thinking about ourselves in relationship to our standing <coughs> or our state in the community or anything like that, rather than thinking about Christ in all of that. 
And so I've had this experience over and over again. And so I believe that the Spirit is in complete control of my life. He will intervene. And I know he has at times where he wouldn't let me do something. Just like Paul wanted to go into Macedonia, but he said the Spirit of God did not allow him. And I believe there are times in our lives where the Spirit exercises his sovereign right his control we're not our own we've been bought with a price we belong to God we're his possession and he can directly intervene whenever it's according to his plan and purpose and so I don't believe that God has laid out our life step by step but he has ordained good works for each one of us and he has guaranteed us that we should walk in them and he is faithful he is able and he will do it and so i take i take responsibility for my life but yet i submit it to god and so let's go on here verse 10 of romans chapter 5 but if christ is in you your body is dead because of sin. Now, of course, we're all sitting here today. We're redeemed, but our bodies are still dead as far as God is concerned. All that thing is is an inanimate tent empowered by your spirit and your soul being enlightened and empowered by the spirit of God. And so, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. That's the difference between life and death. Having the righteousness of Christ in your life. In verse 11, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. In other words, that spirit, the spirit of God living in us, invigorates our soul and our spirit to energize our life for his glory. And so even though this body is dead because of sin, it still has life to function for the glory of God. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we open this study, we look to you for truth. Lord, I pray for each person here that they would fully understand that it is by grace through faith alone that we have each been saved. And then, Heavenly Father, that it's by grace through faith alone that we are each to live. And so we present this truth from your word that your spirit might teach us what he would have us know for this day. And we give you all the praise and the thanks forever and ever. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so it's my intention this morning through the truth of scripture to present that it is only the power of God, the power of the indwelling spirit of Christ that is effective in the spiritual realm. I think in Paul's writings we can find abundant evidence of that truth that in our flesh dwells no good thing but it's through the power of the Spirit that we can do good for the glory of God. Now again, that doesn't mean that the unsaved people or even saved people in the flesh cannot do good things, but it's not in the spiritual realm. There are many wonderful philanthropists, many wonderful people that have sacrificed their lives to the improvement of their communities and to the world there have been great accomplishments uh, all of those things but that has no 
real power or anything in the spiritual realm. It is only through the power of God that anything can be accomplished in the spiritual realm. We don't have that ability. And so we in every circumstance are to trust in the sovereign purpose and plan of God for your life and to trust in his power to perform that which you can't find in yourself. And I don't say that because so many people today say, you do your best and God will do the rest. But that starts to split it up right away. You do all you can do in your flesh and then when there's just that little bit of something left, God will chip in. To me, that's a terrible sacrilegious attack against pure grace because we can't do anything in the flesh to glorify God and so our life with God began and continues as a spirit initiated relationship by the grace of God through faith in the sacrifice on the cross where he died in our place shedding his blood for our sins our new life is a spiritual life of faith it is sovereignly controlled by and is sustained by the power of God let's look at 1 Corinthians 2 5 that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God and in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Remember, uh, I wear this t-shirt a lot of times. It, it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that's what that's talking about. It is God that does the work. We're simply the vessel in which he is energizing us. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Sounds like I shifted to the King James Version in that one. Not that that's bad at all. But uh, we receive Jesus Christ how? By faith alone. Depending or dependent upon the grace of God. So walk ye in him. How? By faith alone. Dependent upon the grace of God. And then these things that follow in verse 7. Rooted and built up. The first one is a perfect passive verb meaning it happened in the past and it is continuing right up to the present we didn't root ourselves it was god that rooted us in christ and he continues to do that and built up that's a present passive verb moment by moment in the very present tense we are being built up in him and established Again, a present passive verb. Every moment by moment, we are being confirmed. We are being made sturdy. Every present situation, the last second, this second, the next second, it's all by his power. Established in the faith. And I believe when Paul uses the term the faith, it begins with saving faith, being a believer in Jesus Christ, but also in the faith, the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God, which is the body of truth for today. And he goes on to say, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And you see, abounding is a present active, so that's talking about us now being active in this. 
And how do we abound? I would submit to you, it's not by what we're doing, it's by what we're believing. What we are doing most frequently is the result of what we believe. And so faith comes first. A lot of people today preach obedience to be blessed or obedience to grow in faith. But I think the scriptures teach just the opposite. Obedience is the result of faith. You were a child of disobedience. When you were saved, you became an obedient child as far as the gospel is concerned. And so why were you obedient? Because you believed the gospel. And so we, have, we really oftentimes, I think, reduce the truth of scripture and try to make it fit into our present evil world. The truth of scripture impacts how we live in this present evil world. But no place do I see where we're trying to change this evil world into something that it's never going to be. Our role in this present evil world is to bring spiritual light to the lost, to give demonstration of Christ living in us in this present evil world. Galatians 3.3. 3. In the book of Galatians, they're trying to do just what I'm talking about here, where they're trying to have some sense of justification before God by their behavior. And oftentimes, we can easily get caught in, up in that. Like saying, oh, isn't that person a wonderful Christian? Or isn't that person a, a wonderful testimony or something? And we're basing it strictly on what we're observing, usually more so than what that person really believes and what's transpiring in his heart. And we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And so we need to be careful not to look around at others and somewhat question their devotion or their faithfulness. Because we don't know God's specific plan and purpose for their life. And I really believe that God has allowed me at times to fall prey to the flesh, to allow me to get caught up in it, only to show me the end of it, which is death, the end of it, which is destruction. There is no good ever going to come from our fleshly activities in the spiritual realm. There just isn't. Other than what God uses it for. And so he says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, Paul's saying, don't you get it? Do you not understand? You couldn't save yourself. Do you now think that you can perfect yourself in your own strength or by what you are doing? It's God who's working in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And so have you been convinced that you are completely powerless in your own strength. As I read before, let's read it again. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then Romans 7, 18, the apostle Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature or in my flesh. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I, Robert R. Newell, I think that's it, William R. Newell, in his book on Romans, has a portion on grace and different aspects of grace. And one of the things that I have taken from that book and paraphrased is, 
To believe you have failed is to have trusted in yourself. Because God will never fail. And so we misunderstand God, I think. If we ever think that God has let us down. If we ever think that God has failed here. That's a lack of faith. God's working all things together for good to them that love him. And so it's not a problem with God. It's our problem with us. Philippians 3.3 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in in the flesh and if you'll remember Paul goes on to say if anyone should have confidence in the flesh I'm more and he goes through this marvelous resume have you been convinced that your life as a member of the body of Christ is totally dependent upon the power of God we all we can do and it's also by his grace and by the convicting work of the Spirit of God is to believe God. And he will give us the faith that will motivate us to do his work in and through us. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began now we gather here today and I think most of us have understanding into what we call the mystery but I can assure you that the vast majority of the professing church doesn't have that insight today and in fact I've shared it with a lot of people who I believe are saved and they outrightly reject it without even investigation they don't need it they know what they believe who are you coming here you're part of a cult all of those kind of things well is God failing if he's sovereign you know, people say, it's God's will that all should be saved, that none should perish. Is he going to save every person? Is he obligated to save any person? That's what grace is all about. None of us deserve to be saved. We all deserve condemnation. But in grace, for his purpose, and according to the riches of his grace, he saves some. And the reaction to that by the majority of believers today say, well, that's not fair. If he's going to save some, he's got to save them all. Who is the potter, or who is the clay to tell the potter what he has to do? And yet, man has been taught this traditionally since hundreds and hundreds of years that it's up to man to choose God and yet I challenge people over and over again and no one's ever responded to me show me one verse in scripture the only one that I can even find anything close to it is that for me and my household we choose to follow the Lord or we will follow the Lord and that's not talking about being saved. That's talking about following the God of Israel with Joshua. And so for us today, we live in a great relationship with God where he is everything and we are the objects of his mercy, the objects of his grace. And when we start to see that, because the argument against my position as far as salvation is concerned and believing that God 
chooses those who he will save. The argument against that is, well, if everybody that's been chosen is going to be saved, why do we preach the gospel? They're going to be saved anyway. Well, nobody is saved apart from the truth of the word of God. And how shall they hear unless someone is sent? And so we preach and teach the truth for his glory and for our privilege to be involved with it. And so if that's our calling to be a evangelist or a preacher or a teacher or just a, a member of the body of Christ to whatever God has called you to, we're not all called to preach the gospel to every creature or something like that. Some people are called and we're to remain where we are in our calling, it says. And so we shouldn't fight God's purpose. All we do is submit and he'll move you. If he's going to have you move from, I'm very comfortable where I am, to someplace where you might be even more comfortable or someplace where you might be even less comfortable, God will take care of that. He's faithful and he's promised us he is able and he will do it. But man wants to be vested in it. And I believe that's what Paul's teaching in so many of his epistles, what I'm putting together here in this message. 1 Corinthians 1 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, Today, there are many churches in the Phoenix area that there will be thousands and thousands of people attending these churches today. And I'm of the opinion that a lot of those people are going there for the attraction of what happens there more so than for the spiritual truth that is presented there. Not that they're wrong or anything like that. But I'm of the opinion that what God is interested in is the proclamation of the gospel of the grace of God. And the music and the drama and all of the showmanship or all of the performance and things might make people feel good and everything else. But unless it is spiritually applied in some fashion, it's wasted on the flesh. And I just believe that. I don't mean to be critical of any other church or anything else, but for me, if I had to stand up here and entertain you week after week, I would quit tomorrow. All, my, all I want to do is bring truth and you deal with it. The same way that I have to deal with it. And I can assure you in most of these messages, I get dealt with directly. In Ephesians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when Paul prayed three times to have this thorn delivered from him, or this thorn in the flesh removed, how does that line up with what Christ said? If you ask anything in my name, my Father which is in heaven will do it. Well, how come Paul had to pray three times then? Or if two or three of you agree with anything here on earth, my Father which is in heaven will do it. How many times have churches, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of people have prayed for some end? And it didn't happen, it turned out almost the opposite. Has God been unfaithful? Did God not have control over that situation? But that's where understanding right division and the mystery becomes so important to live in grace. To simply trust God and his grace is sufficient for you. And that's what he told Paul. Paul says, Three times, where's it where am I now? And he said, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, 
will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And it goes on, well, it's probably going to say it here. Let's read these before I mention this. Ephesians 1.19, Paul prays that he would have the Ephesians know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. How blind or naive can we be if we choose to think that God needs my help to get this done? What he wants from you is your submission. What he wants from you is to say, here's my house, freely dwell in it. Here's my body, I present it a living sacrifice to you. Whether I live or I die is irrelevant. <coughs> Glorify yourself in me. And then Colossians 1.11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. In Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Ephesians 6.10, finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And that passage sort of sums up the whole message. Being made conformable unto his death. In other words, the Apostle Paul wanted to virtually be dead in the flesh. He wanted to be to know the power of his resurrection. That was the power that raised Christ from the dead, lives in us, and the fellowship of his sufferings. In another passage, Paul prayed that he might attain unto the resurrection. When he said that, he uses a word that's only used there. He adds a prefix to it. And what he's really saying, that I might attain unto the out-resurrection. That's not something, the regular resurrection, we're already going to get that. We've already been spiritually resurrected. And some point in the future, we'll be physically resurrected. But Paul wanted to attain to the out-resurrection he wanted to come to a place in his life right now where he was conformable to the death of Christ and he would be walking in resurrected life here on earth. That he would be walking as if he's already been resurrected physically. Even though his body is against that. That was his heart's desire. And I pray that it's your desire. I'm telling you, if you got, like, I don't see any place, and somebody could probably come up with it, but I don't see any place where we're told to set earthly goals or anything like that whatsoever. But we are exhorted over and over again to walk worthy of our calling. But the simple truth is, you have no power to do that. There's no, nothing in your flesh that can do that. The only way that will ever be accomplished if you will submit yourself to the greatness of his power that resides in you. And then walk by faith. It's meant to be that simple. But man wants to calibrate it and academically tear it apart and pick at it and everything else. But we walk by faith, not by sight. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know you and to have the revelation you've given us, not just how to be saved, but how to live in your power. And it's all by grace through faith alone. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that 
your spirit would convince each one of us how to live this life. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In our final hymn,